All right, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How's everyone doing? All right, you get the Joe Samuel show today. My wife's not here, so I'm gonna act up a little bit. So, all right. Yeah, yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, so I'm Joe Samuel. Thank you for coming to our adult forum, our May uh, adult forum series. Uh, on the Abrahamic religions. Um, today we are really, really blessed and honored to have Rabbi Greg Harris here uh, from Congregation Bethel Synagogue. So we're just right down the road on Old Georgetown Road. Many of you have passed by it a thousand times a day because it's right there. Um, rabbi Harris has been rabbi um, at Congregation Bethel for the last 15 years or so. And we are just really pleased as we go through this series um, about learning about some of our basic you know, Abrahamic religious brethren. You know, one of the things that Betsy and I noticed when we decided to, to, to be the adult forum uh, volunteer coordinators this, this season is we thought it'd be really helpful just as there's this political discussions going on and all these things happening around the world, why not take a step back and let's just understand each other, right? Let's do a little basic understanding of each other. Many of us may know more things than others, but why not just try to level set and just let's have a basic understanding of, of our, our other uh, brethren, Abrahamic religious brethren, and start to build some more bridges, right? And so that's really what we're trying to accomplish here. I really appreciate all of you showing up for this. This makes me feel really good, warms my heart. Um, so with that said, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Rabbi Greg Harris. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Joe, for helping facilitate this, putting this together, and thank you to your really wonderful, warm, and growing friendship of your pastor, who I really uh, appreciate uh, our time together as we've gotten to know each other, and so blessed to, to be here within your congregation. The, um, uh, I'm going to present for a while. I want your questions, but I found that it is best that we hold questions until we get through. Um, and what we're focusing on today, what I've been asked to talk about, is some of the basics of Judaism. You know, it's funny that we live amongst each other and we assume that we know things about each other, but I am confident that the basics of Christianity would be just as engaging at, at, our, at my congregation as the basics of Judaism and of Islam might be to you today. So I'm glad that we're, that we're here. So I wanted to start off with uh, this quote. Uh, what you must know is that the aim and objective of the duties of the heart are for both our outer and our inner selves to share equally serving God. I like to start with this for many reasons. One is that there is this duality of faith. Right? There's our outward expression, but there's also an inner journey that we have, and that while other faiths also share that, you'll translate what I'm talking about into your tradition, but Judaism focuses on both of these aspects as well. What I also think is amazing about this is that, look who the author is, Rabbi Bachia ben Joseph ibn Pakud, Pakuda from a small book called Duties of the Heart. Uh, this is in the heyday of Judaism in Spain. Spain at this time is, is controlled uh, and heavily influenced by the Muslim community. And so Jews are, are living and are thriving all over the place, almost all of the time as a minority culture. And even the name itself um, has the, the Arabic influence. Ibn is the equivalent of the son of. Right? So even the Jewish names themselves are taking on the majority culture, right? So my name is Greg Harris. That's the American parlance of it. My Hebrew name is my name, son of my father, Heschel Eliezer Ben Reuven Verifka. My father's name was Reuven or, or Bob as he went by, um, and, right? But here, Bachia, son of Joseph, um, and so we incorporate both the Jewish and the, the Arabic way of, of 
demarcating his name. So there is a lot of just from the very beginning of this duality. So we're going to talk about a number of different things. So the evolution of Judaism, it has developed the defined define modes of worship. And so Judaism isn't free form. It very much has a form of worship that it is dynamic in that over the decades and centuries and literally millennia, it has evolved. Frequently people ask me, I, Rabbi, I want to know about the early, early Judaism because I want to know about the life of Jesus. That makes sense, but it's not a complete understanding because Judaism has been around for 4,000 years. Now, Jesus was only 2,000 years into the story. Right? So really what you're asking is that to understand the life of Jesus, you want to understand actually the life of the rabbis and the early Talmud. That's what that time period is, because Judaism has evolved from the biblical text to the rabbinic era, to the Middle Ages, to our modern times as well. It, and it is continually evolving. And then, of course, there are the rituals and spiritual demands, expectations of Judaism. We call them mitzvot, commandments, but you are expected to do certain things. This is the part no one in the modern world likes, that an outside force places demands on us. But I think that you, in your faith tradition, also are expected to do certain acts, ritual acts and spiritual acts as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about history, a little about the legal system, a little bit about the actual rituals, and then some challenges. One of the challenges this morning is time. So uh, there are parts I'm going to rush through because I know I think we have a hard stop at 11. Is that correct? Right. And I want to leave time for dialogue back and forth as well. So there's two types of time in history. One is historic time, and I call that academic time because that's kind of like dates and places and things like that. But then there's a historic time, which is the time of faith. That's the spiritual timeline that we operate on. These are the, the timelines that we're talking about that are the holiday cycles, your holidays, our holiday cycles. And it relates also to the values that we have that are not time specific, they are independent of time. So do not steal, that was a value when Moses received the law, that was a value in the time of Jesus, and that is a value that continues today. That's why I mean it is disconnected from a calendar, it is ahistoric, it is a value that we share over time. So what is this holiday cycle? Well, it has been said by Rabbi Michael Strassfeld, the special days of the festival cycle are not random moments scattered over the year, but purposeful occurrences that draw their power from multiple sources. The natural world and its seasons, myth, religious traditions, folk customs, and decisive historical events in the life of our people. I think that the statement, you know, apply to your holiday cycles, that they all fit in with uh, this beautiful structure um, of, of understanding. So in the ideal, we've created kind of all of these things come into play in one way or the other. And again, think of your holidays. There's aspects of nature, aspects of myth, I call it like a small m myth, not myth like Zeus or Apollo or things like that, but myth, like this is our mythic story, our national story, our people's story. There is of course history and there is faith involved. But there's also the cycle of communal experiences as well. There's a communal aspect, a together, a gathering around a particular holiday. There's something profound that brings you beyond yourself. There's also a home-based aspect of it. Right? So while there's things that happen at the synagogue, there's also experiences that happen at home. 
Sometimes they're more home-based than synagogue-based. Passover, the great holiday that is so well-known, is probably one that tends more to be home-based than synagogue-based. Things like Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, more synagogue-based, communal-based than they are that take place at home. And all of these things, and I think this is the part that gets overlooked too often, they're sensory experiences as well, right? There's something that ignites you. These are the things that we think of only for kids, but they really elevate our experience as well, of a sensory experience within the holidays. So the high holidays are the ones that are most well known. Rosh Hashanah, our new year, the, we're in the year 5777, but I will tell you, and I, I will say that I heard your pastor, I went online and I listened to your sermon last week, and you said this exact thing. If we walk around saying that we're only 6,000 years old, that we come across as stupid, I think was the quote. And I said, oh, you tell it, brother. <laughs> So if I go around saying that the world is only 57, 77 years old, that is not what the story is, but this may be part of our mythic experience, so that traditionally this is the Jewish year, dated from the time of creation, but I assure you, dinosaurs and a lot of other things are a lot older than that. It, Rosh Hashanah is a period of repentance, um, and we tend to use lots of symbols that are around, around the chala, the cycle of the year, the cycle of life. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. The metaphor is, are the books of life and death. This is a time of, of judgment. Um, again, is it metaphoric or is it literal? Well, these are modes of interpretation, just like within Christianity. Your, the flavors of Christianity is the host actually the body and blood? Is it metaphorically the body of blood? That is yours to argue with amongst your brethren. Um, but we have our own divisions amongst Judaism as well. Um, but I think very much uh, the idea of, of a metaphoric or symbolic use of ritual is very, very powerful. Uh, and of course, the communal prayers and the fasting of Yom Kippur. Those are the high holidays, the, the ones that you've heard of, the ones of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and a little bit about Passover. So I'm starting off with the big, the big ones you've heard of. Passover, of course, the celebration of the exodus from Egypt. This has been an uh, image and a story that has been used across time and across faith traditions. Um, this idea of, of leaving the oppressed and, and embracing freedom and realizing that it is not easy. It is a journey. Um, the academics say that it was approximately around 1300 before the Common Era. That's how we demarcate time rather than BC and AD. We say before the Common Era and now we are in the Common Era the Seder you're aware of, and again, this is one of those ideal holidays. Right? So to look back at this chart, Passover has all of these experiences that wrap up together. And I would invite you to take a slide like this and just to apply it to your holidays, right? to think about how do your holidays fit within this experience. I bet that each one of these cycles, many of them would pop out at Easter, at Christmas, at, at any of the other holidays that, that, that you have. So, but let's give the overview of the holidays for all the, for the whole year. And this would be a chart that I think a lot of Jews would appreciate. Um, <laughs> really, there's something beyond Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Passover? I didn't know that, Rabbi. So, of, of course, not even on here, is every Saturday is the Sabbath. The Shabbat is, is every Saturday. For you, it is on Sunday. But the, the larger holiday cycle in the fall, we have the high holidays and Sukkot and Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah is the celebration of the reading cycle of the Torah, that we end with Deuteronomy and we immediately pick up again with Genesis. Think of, again, that cycle. In the winter, we have Hanukkah. In the spring, Tu B'Shvat, which may be a new one to you, uh, but it is a, uh, a holiday of the environment, basically, the holiday of trees. Purim, I think this is the story of Esther, 
in the book of the book of Esther. That's the holiday of Purim, Passover we talked about. And then the summer, we're, and we're leading right up to Shavuot now, that Shavuot is 50 days after Passover. It says in the Bible that you should count off 50 days from the time of Passover until Shavuot. Um, in the Bible, it is an agriculture holiday. Um, this time period, we actually count each day. This is the first day, this is the second day, this is the third day. So we're at the 40th day, and so I know in about a week and a half, I have to start stressing because there's more holidays and things that take place. Um, but uh, uh, from an agricultural holiday, it gets transformed 1,500 years ago or more uh, into uh, the holiday of Mount Sinai, I would call it. That this is the recognition of Moses receiving revelation at Mount Sinai. And there's a wonderful tradition that you should rush to go do a mitzvah, the rabbis say. You should rush to go do something. There's a story that the Israelites slept in uh, on the morning of revelation. Right? And so they woke up and they're like, where's where Moses and all of this? The tradition has come that you actually spend all night studying the night before so that you are aware and ready and excited for revelation. So we take that, we'll probably study, I think the first study session is about 7.30 uh, on this night. Um, and we'll end at around one in the morning because we still have to get up for services the next morning. But, um, but it is a great experience and one of the things that I always love about it is I love holidays that most people don't do. They're a little more intimate. They are exciting. But if you can't sleep that night and you want to learn a little Bible or the, the text, the central text for Shavuot is actually the book of Ruth, um, that your people shall be my people, that I will follow you. Um, it is the example of someone, in this case, a biblical woman who we generally don't hear a lot from, accepting revelation, right? She comes into Judaism um, and accepts this relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Um, and so that becomes the important text. And I love the parallel. Moses at Mount Sinai becomes Ruth to Naomi. Um, and I think it's a beautiful text. So, uh, and then finally, in the midst of the holiday uh, is Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the recognition of the destruction of the temple. Um, the second temple is destroyed in the year 70. Um, interestingly, within Jewish history, um, the people that wanted to destroy us also needed to know a lot about us. And let me tell you why that the, for all of the energy that the church put into uh, editing our prayer books, they trained scholars in Hebrew so that they could edit the prayer books and take out things that theologically they didn't like. That inadvertent, uh, that the, the hatred inadvertently trained a bunch of scholars in Hebrew that helped Hebrew survive. W they had to spend so much time that actually the expulsion from Spain, and we know this because it's a, it's a written historical document, the expulsion from Spain in 1492, my mom, when I was growing up, she said, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and they threw us out of Spain. <laughs> so, so in 1492, when the Jews were expelled from Spain and then a year or two later from Port Portugal and, and on and on, they did it purposefully on Tisha B'Av because just, again, that historical coming around again, just as the temple was destroyed on Tisha B'Av, we want to show that we are destroying you in the same way on Tisha B'Av. Yet it was all of those, uh, even though their intentions were bad, they had to train up and that was part of actually the, the inadvertent survival of Judaism. Right? As they were trying, uh, as I mentioned, they were trying to uh, uh, they were trying to edit all of, the, all of the Jewish prayer books and Jewish sources, so they had to create libraries of it so that they could train themselves. Well, those libraries become uh, important, uh, important libraries beyond themselves as well. The holiday cycle, tw 12 lunar months, 
we work on, a, we being here in the States and the modern world, we work on a solar calendar. Um, Judaism and Islam work on a lunar calendar. The difference is that Islam does not have a leap year. So slowly every year, the holiday cycle shifts. And I'm sure two weeks ago that he, he must have talked about how Ramadan is in this season, but it shifts back every couple, you know, every year it shifts back a couple days. Um, we, in the American calendar, the Gregorian calendar, of course, we have February 29th, which is supposed to compensate to keep all of the holidays and our cycle correct or in the same season. Judaism is a lunar calendar that has a corrective, though, um, but it's not as simple as every four years add a day. That would be really nice. Um, it's a more complicated, but we want to make sure that the agricultural holidays stay in the agricultural season. Right? That Shavuot is always around now, that Hanukkah, is, the festival of lights, is always at the darkest period of the year. And so we do have a corrective, but we are a lunar calendar. Months are roughly the same months as we, as we have now because, it, again, it's the cycle of the moon. Um, you can actually, uh, as I'm sure you know, Hebrew goes right to left, English goes left to right. The moon goes right to left. So the moon operates like Hebrew. So you can situate yourself in time, look out at the moon, um, and a new moon is when you see a sliver on the right-hand side. A full moon is the middle of the month, so it'll be around the 15th of the Hebrew month. And as, if you see the moon on the left-hand side, uh, that means you're later into the Hebrew month. Okay? So Hebrew, the moon works like Hebrew. And it allows you to situate yourself in time, which I think is an incredible thing that we don't do in our normal, busy life. So if I'm correct, um, that uh, the moon is on the right-hand side now, look tonight, and you'll know that we're later in the Hebrew month. Um, so challenge me, you look outside t tonight. Um, that, um, so some of those, these ahistoric, these eternal values, now these are things, there are two categories, ben, ben Adam le Chavaro, between a person and their friend, and ben adam la makom, between a person and God. And I just listed some of these to give you a concept as to what these values are, that you should visit the sick, you should honor your parents, you should seek peace. These are things between people. And some of the examples of the ahistoric values that are beyond time, they are always relevant, is praising God. Uh, sheker, falsehood, falsehood, lying, not alternative facts, right? But like actually like lying is seen within, within the faith as not just something that's happening between people, but when you are lying between people, you are breaking a promise with God, right? That you are lying. And of course, a love of creation, just as quick examples of, of each of these categories. So the legal system that we have a text tradition um, and also uh, I'm sure there's, if your congregation is like my congregation, there's probably a few lawyers here, um, uh, a system of, of precedence. But, oh, well, I guess the Hebrew didn't really come through here. That's what those, <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, that is not what Hebrew looks like. <laughs> so, but it did this morning when I looked over this. So, so we have the Torah and the Tanakh. The Tanakh is the phrase Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, that that makes up the Torah, the five books of Moses. Nevi'im is the book of prophets, uh, and Ketuvim is the book of writings. And you know all, all of these in here, right? This is the book of Ruth, as I mentioned, the book of Psalms, uh, those are in the book of, of writing. The book of prophets, you know, that's all of the guys, Ezekiel and... Joshua and Judges and, you know, the, Jeremiah, Zechariah, or Zechariah. These are all the names of the prophets. Together, the Jewish canon is called the Tanakh, the Tanakh. Um, the Talmud is this rabbinic writing, right? So when I said that this is the time of Jesus, 
Right, so to understand, you don't want to look at the old biblical time period. Right? That's much, much older than Jesus. This time period of the Talmud is much more in the range of Jesus and the disciples. 60 to 600 roughly is the time period that academics give to the Talmud. And these are all the things that you've heard. Rabbi Yossi says this, and Rabbi Akiva says that, and the arguments of the rabbis. No, they did not all live at the same time period, but the way that these texts are brought together and edited together, it seems like they are sitting in the same room together, arguing with each other, and it is a fascinating fascinating series of texts. I mean, it takes up this much space on a, on a bookshelf. There's volumes and volumes, and each volume, of course, has pages and pages of argument about different aspects of life and of law. The Shulchan Aruch, um, 1550, it becomes the major legal law book. Um, and then, of course, there's the Sidorim, the prayer books, and modern books continue. Um, Judaism has, did not stop in 1550, um, and there are shelves and shelves, or in this day and age, websites and websites full of Jewish books and thoughts and reflections on law. We probably originated the system of precedence. Um, it goes all, the, a system of precedent goes all the way back to the Bible when Yitro, Jethro, goes to his son-in-law, Moses, and says, you need to set up a legal system here. You can't do this all on your own. Um, and so uh, uh, the, a system of precedent and a, a legal system is established. Um, we always preserve the minority opinion, similar to the Supreme Court today. Because in some future ruling, the minority opinion in that case may become the basis for some future ruling. Um, and so the majority and the minority are always kept within the, within the religious tradition as well. And be, there's a rich she'elot and chuvot, questions and answers. There's a rich history of letters being written back and forth across great geographic areas of questions and answers between the rabbinic authorities and people out just living their life that had questions. Um, and this becomes, these collections of letters being passed back and forth become a treasure trove for historians and for theologians uh, and for legal scholars who are interested in what's happening out in communities in the Middle Ages and, and, and before. Um, the basic rituals have not changed with their Hebrew there. But there's prayer, there's dietary laws, kashrut, um, there's Shabbat, there's our values of, uh, our, our value system, which continues um, as well. Um, that there is um, some of the basic ideas of prayer, when I talked about that it is structured, that it is formalized. Traditionally, there's prayer three times a day. I won't tell you how many people actually come to Morning Minion on a Tuesday morning, uh, the morning service at the synagogue, but traditionally three times uh, a day. There's a prayer leader called a shaliach Sibor who does not have to be a rabbi and generally is not a rabbi, um, that it is someone from the community who just steps up and, and can perform that role. Um, of course, theologically, there's, there's no intermediary between uh, between the individual and God. So the role of, you know, my role uh, is not as the interse intercessor, um, it is simply to facilitate. Um, uh, the prayer services are both, prayer life is both focused on individual experience of prayer and the communal experience of prayer. We have prayer books, and really the focus of prayer is to focus on connection and, and meaning. Um, not just to get through the, the process. So there are challenges to finding this personal meaning, though. That the first is that Hebrew is tough, right? The computer couldn't even get the Hebrew. That it's, it, you, we pray in a foreign language, and it's not just like, where's the bathroom type foreign language, right? This is poetry. It's poetry, so you need to know the language so well that you could read poetry. Think of whatever you took in high school, right? And you need to know it even more, 
right? Or think about the languages that you've acquired along the way and how hard it was until you felt that you could actually read poetry in that language. It's a completely different level of it. And most American Jews don't know it at that level. And so the, one of the challenges of modern Judaism is how we translate, or bridge, I should say, which some of that bridge is translation, to incorporate English, to educate on the Hebrew. Um, because the language, the Hebrew as the language, is a unifying connection between Jews all around the world. Right? So we, all, all of our prayer books have Hebrew and English. But when you go to Paris, it is French and Hebrew. Or when you go to you know, wherever you might go, it will be Hebrew and the lingua franca, the, the language that's spoken at that time in that place. And of course, there's the choreography, when to stand, when to sit, when to bow, when to do this. Right? All the things that you take for granted in your service, but you had to learn it somewhere from someone, and most of it's done through modeling, um, and how you invite people into your community is helping them understand how and what and why. Um, and we have that same challenge, the how, the what, and the why. Our services do have a pattern. They're, they are structured. There's the morning service, the afternoon service, and the evening, Shachrit, Mincha, and Mariv. The main parts of the service are called the Shema and the Amidah. The Shema, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I would say if there's any point of a dogma within Judaism, that is probably the theological statement of a, both a relationship with God um, and also monotheism, that God is one. Um, and that there is a, a, a system to, to this. Dietary laws, um, I'll just kind of uh, rush through. But the idea of it is that eating is something that we do every single day, right? That at, at least three times a day, and if you're anything like me, it's more than just three times a day, right? And the eating is about transformation. It's not just about eating, because we are emulating God. So as God is holy, we should also be holy. And that holiness happens through mindfulness. It happens through an awareness. So choosing what you are eating, looking at a menu wherever you go and making a thoughtful choice about what you are doing. That mindfulness is holiness. So for Jews, it is you're choosing not to eat bacon, you're choosing not to eat other things that are delicious, I'm told, right? Lobster, shrimp, things like that. But it's that act of mindfulness. So think about, um, Think about what you do in your life and how you can use the daily choices of food to make yourself holy. Whether it be vegetarianism, whether it be uh, organic, whether it be whatever it might be. Um, but there are many modes that we can make our, transform this act of eating from a low level act to elevate ourselves. Um, and kashrut is the way Jews do, do that. The, the basic separation of milk and meat, no cheeseburgers, um, recognizing the sanctity of the animal. Um, and so we recognize that a, a living being has died so that we can have the hamburger. Uh, and so we restrain ourselves. We wait for a period of time before we go back and we eat whatever we want after that. And so there's a custom of waiting um, roughly about three hours after you eat meat as a sign of recognition that a living being died so that you could eat that. Um, system of, of kosher ingredients and that we offer prayers um, before and after. Saying grace is the equivalent. Shabbat is experiential, it's communal focused, it's home, it is a palace in time Rabbi jo uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, it is carving out a period of time in the week so that we can uh, celebrate and sanctify. And just as God rested, so do we rest. Uh, God rested from creation, and so we recognize that. We ideally disconnect from our phones 
because yes, it is possible for one day to do that. Um, that and we also uh, do things to celebrate and to stay focused together. Um, and to make Shabbat, is there a should of Shabbat? What would you have to do for you to feel that you made a Sabbath? Think about these questions in terms of Sundays, right? That for you as an individual or as family, what would it take for you to have to do on that day to say, I made this a Sabbath. I made today a, a, a spiritual Sabbath by what I'm doing today because just showing up to church isn't enough. Right? Just showing up at a particular time, there's something more that that means to make a Sabbath, whether it's at the synagogue or at the church. And so think about that question. I think that's what the Bible wants us to be thinking about. And then, of course, what's the largest blocker from you? Oftentimes it might just be, I've never been posed that question, or it's inconvenient. So we just got to own that um, as well, that, well, yeah, I get that that's an ideal to make the Sabbath, and it's just inconvenient with the because I'm a busy person. So I get all that, but we just need to own that that it's that, that we're putting our own blockers up there. And of course, these are some of the modern challenges of faith. Right? What is authenticity in faith? What's the relevance of faith? And of course, we live like a supermarket, right? Like the, there's so much we can do, right? You go to the supermarket and there's 15 different yogurts to choose from. How do I choose a yogurt, let alone when I go down the aisle and then there's 37 orange juices with pulp, without pulp, with calcium or without, or with vitamin D or without, right? It's impossible. We are overloaded with choice today, and that extends into our faith as well. I can show up, I cannot show up, I can do this, I can do that, but the question is, remember at the very beginning I talked about how Judaism has expectations of us. So where do those things come together? Expectations of faith and the radical choice that we live in and have the ability to do for, for today. So the take home today is how are you making your faith meaningful to you? And how are you sharing this commitment to faith with those around you? Uh, we have about 15 minutes. Um, and I would love to uh, unpack or go into other directions. Uh, and I would just ask to, if you could uh, say your name so I can get to know you better. Yeah, in the purple. Sure, Barbara, Barbara asks um, the life after death and what happens after you die. My, my joke always is, uh, we, we sit catty corner to Bethesda United Methodist. I say, in Judaism, we've never had anyone that's died and come back, but go over across the street and ask them because that's an important part of their narrative, right? So we, we've never had anyone. But um, that there is life af after death. Um, but the question that is unclear is what does that look like? We know that our bodies are, are physical and are limited. We die. But our belief is also that our soul is eternal. But think about our understanding of life after death. All of the way we understand the world is all through our senses, right? The way we understand anything about the world is through our five senses. Our hearing, our sight, our smell, our taste, our touch. I think that was five, or smell. Um, when we lose one of those, if you go blind, you compensate, but it's a radical different way of understanding it. If you lose two of those senses, then I, I can't even imagine what it, what it might be. But in death, you lose all of those senses. But our soul, in, an, in a not physical way, continues. So I can't understand what the world to come is going to be like because it's going to be without any of the ways I interact with the world. 
um, it's not going to be a physical resurrection. And of course, if you do believe in a physical resurrection, and there are aspects of Judaism that do, I haven't come across the answer of, do you come back as your 20-year-old prime vibrant self that <laughs> is foolish? Or do you come back as your 80-year-old wisdom with some chronic problems as well? Right? Or if you were born, uh, if you were born with a deficit of some sort, are you born without that as if you were imperfect in your birth and you will be perfected? I, I, and on and on those questions. So physical resurrection has its own set of theological and even just moral questions that I haven't been able to figure out. But the only way that I can understand how to move forward is the idea that it may not be a physical resurrection. That may be the metaphor, um, but that our soul is eternal. And therefore, the world to come isn't something that I can describe because I can't describe the world without my senses. So I hope that adds some, some you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you, I'm Sylvia. And Sylvia. I wanted to, to ask you a question regarding to Judaism, because it's uh, modern, orthodox, and, uh, and yeah. so on. So do you have a top authority to, uh, you know, to, to let's say, uh, make sure that they don't go too far away there from is, each other. There is no Pope of Judaism. Yeah. <laughs> but even, I don't know, spiritual. And the second one, what, what do you reckon, you know, in terms of um, all this, you know, progressive um, um, uh, orthodox, uh, what's the attitude to changing um, to the challenges of the uh, world, like politics, uh, other uh, faith, Islam, Christianity, and the role of women? And the, and the, the role of women, women uh, of women. Yeah. Well, I married one, and she is the boss. That she's my pope. Um, the uh, it's a great question. There are different flavors of Judaism. There's Orthodox, conservative, of which I'm a part of, Reform, and I'm moving over kind of on the political spectrum. Uh, and there's Reconstructionist, and even be it beyond that. Um, that. Um, uh, uh, and each has its own take. There is no pope of Judaism, um, so everyone kind of does their own thing. Each flavor of Judaism, if you will, each movement of Judaism has their own kind of uh, uh, track and, and traditions that they follow. Um, that uh, uh, Bethel uh, uh, and myself tend to be a little more on the progressive side, even though it's conservative. Conservative means to conserve. Um, that we are conserving the traditions while also bringing them into the modern world. Right? So that's where the conservative movement, before there was uh, the pol politics of conservatism, um, it means to conserve the tradition that we shouldn't just do away with, with it. So that's why we preserve Hebrew, we preserve many aspects of traditional observance. Um, uh, women are rabbis w within, there's orthodoxy where they're not, Outside of orthodoxy, women are ordained as, as spiritual leaders, as rabbis, as cantors, um, which is another clergy position. Um, uh, the, an issue that uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst the movement uh, is gay weddings. Um, and uh, we've said that we would do a same-sex wedding. We've never been asked to. Um, there is an assumption that conservative Rabbis will not, because this is a, a change. Um, we think that actually the wedding is not going to be the problem. We think that when, when, they, when people are called to the bima, called to the pulpit to receive their blessing before the wedding, that's the public aspect, right? Who goes to a wedding? Only your people that you invite, so it's not a big deal, right? But the communal aspect, so we're aware of, of that. That'll be in, interesting, and also the language and and all of these things because it is different. And so you, um, it's, it's not the same. The, the language of the ceremony should reflect what it is, so it should be different. And, and I'm ready to cross that bridge you know, of what the actual wedding language would look like. Um, you know, uh, another is uh, interfaith marriages. Um, that, that's actually the issue that, that we've been working on now, not just marriages, but families, right? So how within the congregation, what are the vast number of yeses and embraces that we have? 
and also to not be shy about where the no's are as well, you know, where the boundaries are. I always say, just like when I go to church, I don't take communion in a church that offers communion because it's not my faith tradition. It would be inappropriate for me to go do that. And that's a no that I'm fine with. Within the synagogue, there are also ritual no's that people are fine with if you articulate it and if you talk about it. Um, I think too often today, we are so focused on we're all together in kumbaya that we actually don't talk about where the differences are. And that's actually the really interesting part, um, where the boundaries of communities are. Um, and so we should just be open with that. So that's a little bit more. Does that get to where you were looking at? Great. Terrific. Uh, yeah, over to the other side. Hello. I'm um, Peter, and I was just wondering, does um, not have not do it weeks of three hours, does that mean you um, have the, um, the annual three hours before you eat? Does that mean you don't eat meat for like three hours after you um, eat dinner with meat? Or? Well, let's get very practical, Peter. It means no ice cream with your meatloaf, right? <laughs> Right? That, it means that whatever you're having for dessert with your meatloaf is going to be a fruit salad or something that's called parav, is what we, we say. You know, it's going to be like an Italian ice or something, um, or it's going to be a brownie that is made without milk in it. So again, you need to make choices. So this idea of mindfulness not only goes into the menu, but also extends to the meal as well and after as well. So again, Eating is not about gorging and satisfying your desires. It is about having some humility in the experience. So, yeah, so no ice cream with your meatloaf. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carl Schaefer. Uh, at the risk of oversimplifying, at least in the United States, there's a pretty strong association between Judaism and social justice. Yes. And I know that this would fall under one of your eternal values, I think. But do you see uh, within the United States that commitment coming primarily out of the law? Or is it something that comes more out of the historical, cultural tradition of American Judaism and coming out of European Judaism or all of the above? Sure, sure. Well, it, it's interesting. Um, that, so tikkun olam is the phrase, repairing the world. The theological origins of it are not its modern meaning. The theological origins of it come from the mystical idea that the world is broken. Before there was science and physics, there was theology. And theology tried to understand the world. And so, if God is everywhere, this was the a foundational question, God is everywhere and makes room for the creation of the world. This is the beginning of Genesis. Makes room for the planets and stars. So what happens with God's essence, right? If God is physically everywhere, right? How do you make room for something else, right? You have a tank of water, right? and you, the water is everywhere in the tank. But if you want to put something in it, we would call that displacement. That's the stuff that spills over. How, what happens with the spiritual displacement when God creates the physicality of it? And what the, what the theologian said was that God actually put that extra essence into vessels and put it in a storehouse, okay? That's the way that they got their minds around it. It's an interesting question, right? The vessel, but nothing can contain God. And so those vessels broke. And t the tikkun is trying to repair God's essence and to make it whole again. The tikkun that we're doing is a spiritual repair of God, not just of the world around us. So that was the origin of this idea of repair. It gets translated over time into we need to repair the world as a way. The problem is, is that today, most of us think that just serving the meal at shepherd's table, just helping out interfaith works, 
that our job is done. Totally wrong. Unless you encounter the person before you who you are serving the meal to, unless you recognize that they themselves are B'Tselem Elohim, also created in God's image, you are not doing the repair. You're just giving someone a meal. It is that spiritual encounter that has to happen that is so much harder. And so what to apply it to any of the social justice causes until you encounter someone, just holding up a sign isn't enough. Now, until, unless you just going out to the airport with a sign to protest the ban is not enough. So what are we doing to help refugees? and encountering them. Because a slogan is a step, but it's not the theological step that the tikkun requires. I hope that answers a bit. Yeah, great. It's up to, I have time, but we're at 11 o'clock. I think the pastor has, do you want the last question? Great. So I will be here, um, but thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to doing more, more together to bring our congregations together in, in many more ways. So thank you very Over much. Here, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Great.